Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's event for the Unbound Book Festival. My name is Alex George, and I am the director of Unbound. Tonight's discussion is called In It Together, Writing, Community, and Craft. And as someone for whom all three of those things are of enormous interest, I've been looking forward to this event ever since we put it together. As you may know, the festival has always been completely free to attend, whether in person or online, and this wouldn't be possible without the generosity of the hundreds and hundreds of people who have supported us financially over the years. If you go to the website, which is uh, unboundbookfestival.com, you'll see a list of everyone who's given over the last two years. It is a very long list, and we are very grateful to each and every person who has given. Support comes to from the Office of Cultural Affairs and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. And we're also grateful to the Boone Electric Cooperative Foundation and the Assistance League of Mid-Missouri for their support. Particular thanks this evening goes to tonight's sponsor, Friends of MU Libraries. The festival has partnered with MU Libraries ever since we began this adventure back in 2016. And we're so grateful to them for their continued sponsorship for the last six years. Unbound, as you probably know, is all about audience interaction, and we would love you to join in this evening's conversation, just as you would if, if we were gathering in person. I know that there are many, many writers in Colombia, and that our local writing community is a strong one, even if it's been difficult to gather over the past few months. Please feel free to post questions for the panelists in the chat box, and they will get to them towards the end of the session. And to encourage you to participate, we will, as usual, be giving away uh, a copy of each of the panelists' most recent books to one randomly selected audience member who asks a question. Somehow, there are only a few events left in this year's festival, but all events are archived online, and you can watch or even re-watch them uh, both on our Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, remember that our keynote event featuring Tracy K. Smith and Jericho Brown is now just a couple of weeks away on Friday, April the 23rd, Shakespeare's birthday, appropriately enough. And I would strongly, strongly recommend that you tune in to watch that conversation. Anyone who saw Jericho when he appeared on our poetry and prayer panel several weeks ago will know that he is someone not to miss if you can possibly help it. And with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome this evening's participants, Laura Munson and Julie Matz. Although I've never met Laura in person, I kind of feel as if I do know her a little bit as we were both published by Amy Einhorn Books and Imprint of Penguin back in the day. And we both had the privilege of having our books edited by the Imprint's eponymous editor, Amy Einhorn. In addition to being a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author, Laura founded the Haven Right, having writing retreats and workshops in Montana where she lives. She, she is a regular speaker at women's conferences and literary events, and she speaks and teaches on the subjects of empowerment, creative self-expression, and the language of change. She has appeared on Good Morning America, The Early Show, NPR, WGN, and many other media outlets across the globe. Julie Metz is a New York Times bestselling author of Perfection. She has written on a wide variety of women's issues for many publications, including the New York Times, Salon, Red Book, and Glamour. Her personal essays have appeared in the anthologies The, Mo the Moment and The House That Made Me. She has been a fellow at Yaddo, the McDowell Connolly, uh, Colony, the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, and the Vermont Studio Center. And her newest book, which is published today uh, is Eva and Eve. So Julie, first and foremost, happy publication day. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's really a pleasure to be here on the stage. Yeah. Great. Right. Well, I will leave the two of you to it and I'll come back at the end to wrap things up. Okay. Great. Thank you, Alex. Hi, Julie. Happy publication day. Hi. Nice to be here. <laughs> nice to yeah. see you and to be a part of this. So just to give everybody the lay of the land and thank you so much, Alex, and for the Unbound Book Festival. Um, it's so great to be able to do this, even if it's online. And Julie is a, a wonderful author and also my friend. And the two of us have put together, just to give you the lay of the land first, four powerful questions to ask of one another. And then we're going to braid them together. And then at the end, we'll answer any questions that come up. Something tells me that a lot of your questions will be answered um, through our questioning of one another. And first, each of us will read a short excerpt from our books and talk a bit about what the books are about. And then we'll get into the discussion. So Julie, let's start off um, 
the way that we talked about with um, the invitation from Willis Grove, because yeah. I, think it yeah. invites, I think it's an inviting way to bring people into our discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so here, this is the ARC that's all beat up. and Yeah, that's your reading copy, right? <laughs> Every author has one. Yeah. So, the, my book is about uh, four women. It's a novel. And Julie's book is um, about is, is a memoir. She'll tell you about it. But my book is a, about four women who are all at major crossroads moments who come together in Montana to help each other figure out what's next in their lives. And I, I, we'll talk more about the inspiration behind it. Um, but the, there's a letter to the reader that's at the end of the book. And to me, this book is, is, a, is a true novel, but it's also a call to action that I hope will start a movement. So here's the letter to the reader. Uh, and then I'll read you the invitation, which is the beginning of the book, and then we'll go from there. So there's a line that comes out of one of the characters' mouths about three quarters of the way through the book, which I feel captures what this book is ultimately about, and really what Julie and I will be talking about tonight. And she says, you know, we're all fluent in this language, in the language of community, and yet we so rarely speak it. It really is our mother tongue. So one more time, you know, we're all fluent in this language, in the language of community. And yet we so rarely speak it. It really is our mother tongue. <clears throat> and here's the letter. Dear reader, I have learned something that might just be the most important lesson of my life and I would like to share it with you. There is a language that we crave, a language of the heart that grows from our worry and our wonder and our stories rooted in our experience of this beautiful and heartbreaking thing called life. Too many of us have trained ourselves out of speaking that language. We were all fluent in it when we were children, but somewhere along the way we were taught or conditioned to forget it, to not be honest when we are asked, how are you? And to not really listen to the answer when we ask others the same question. So many of us have lost our authentic voices and reduced our conversations to grocery store talk and texts with an emoji at the end. The truth is, we long to be seen and heard and accepted, especially when we are in pain. Yet, out of fear of judgment or rejection, we too often draw in and become islands rather than bridging to our family and friends. I know this because at times I've made that choice and the fallout from that led me to devote a major piece of my life to bringing people together in safe, intimate circles of self-expression which led me to write this book. I wrote Willis Grove to capture the power of people stepping out of the isolation. Boy, is that timely right now. Out of the isolation and self-doubt that so many of us feel in times of transition and instead gathering together. These women show us that we don't have to endure hardship alone, nor should we. We have choices. If for whatever reason connecting with our usual community is too fraught, we can instead create temporary circles, friend to friend to friend to friend, carving out small interludes from our daily lives in order to focus on what comes next, to have those conversations we need to be having but aren't, to move boldly outside of small talk, gossip, pretending, and into the connection we so deeply need. I hope that in reading this book and in the spirit of Willa, Bliss, Harriet, and Jane, you will be inspired to reach out to your own dear friends, whether close by or far away, and that you will invite them to come together for short respites to support one another in the powerful way that people can when they give themselves permission to say yes to the profound invitations of their lives. My mission is this, we will start a movement of week-long interludes from the stresses and pain of our crossroads moments and in radical and real communication. We will provide ourselves and our kindreds with a map for our next steps. Our voices deserve to be honored and heard. No one has your voice, no one. However we speak, now is the time for truth. And yes, we don't have to do it alone. Yours, Laura. Now, that's the that's the call to action piece. And when I wrote this book, I never thought how timely it would be. 
So this is the way it begins, just a few more pages, and then we're gonna pass it over to Julie. The book begins with a chapter called The Women. <clears throat> On a typical day in their typical lives, three women went to their mailboxes and found amid junk mail and bills and shiny flyers for unshiny things, an invitation sealed with a bold W pressed into sage green wax. They had been waiting for this invitation. They longed for it as much as they feared it because to break this seal was to release a behemoth of a question, a question so impossible that they had almost stopped asking it. Each hesitated, looked around and in respective order thought, sweet Jesus, what the hell? Here goes nothing and slid her finger under the seal, revealing a thick handmade note card pressed with silvery leaves. Words winked up at them, words that might, if given the chance, change everything. They swallowed and pulled out the card. Inside, nestled with a wild bird feather, were the following words. You are invited to the rest of your life. You know you can't go on like this. Not for one more day. You need an interlude. Imagine this, you are in a farmhouse in Montana wrapped in a soft blanket, sitting by a warm wood stove. There's a cup of tea in your hand, just the way you like it. There are women surrounding you who need this just as badly as you do. We all have the same question. The question is, so now what? Come to Montana and find out. Love, Willa. You don't have to do this alone. Each woman held the invitation to her heart, drew in a deep breath before letting out an exhausted sigh that echoed from Connecticut to Wisconsin to California and back to Montana and went inside to call a dear friend. So that's how Willis Grove begins. And I hope that you all will think about that invitation for your own lives. So Julie, Let's hear your excerpt. Yeah, so I'll just introduce uh, the book a bit. Um, this is a memoir, and um, here is the cover. And um, this is uh, a book that is about um, my mother and her family. Um, it's how it, it's a, sort of a survival and escape story of how my mother's family got out of um, Nazi Vienna in 1940 when it was extremely hard to get out and extremely difficult to come to America. So it was a time, I think, uh, not unlike the time that we're in now where people felt very isolated. There was a great fear of the other. And so to get an American visa really was um, like winning the lottery. But somehow they, uh, well, that's what the book is about is how that all came together. I will just read a bit of the opening now, which sort of describes the setup. And first I will show you a photograph that appears just opposite the first chapter, which is my mother uh, here. <laughs> um, and this is my mother at the age of about nine and a half. And um, a lot of people say we look alike, I'm not sure. Um, and as you can see, she is a very, confident looking young girl. And uh, one of the things that was so poignant when I found this photograph in the, in the family album is that on the back side, my grandmother, I'm assuming it's my grandmother had written on the back, January, 1938. Two months later is when everything went crazy. And that is the part that I'm just going to introduce you to now. The opening, it's the prologue of the book and it's titled, Ava at Nine. I've never met this sweet child who smiles at me with the confidence of a well-loved daughter. She is pretty, well-groomed, well-fed. She poses on her own in a comfortable sitting room, but in her easy gaze, I sense the presence of other people, parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, and the unknown photographer. Behind her, a few hints of the room's decor, rounded backrest of an elegant wooden chair, sideboard decorated with a lacy cloth, 
door framed in carved molding against a patterned wallpaper, all recede in layers of gauzy focus. What is it about this girl? She seems at once so innocent, yet so knowing. Her plump cheeks are incarnadine, like a morsel of blush-tinted marzipan. Yet something about the intensity of her dark eyes tells me she is fiercer than her sweet presentation. She will need that fierceness. In two months, this girl's country will be taken over by a cohort of extremists led by an authoritarian germaphobe who hates people of her kind. He sees them as filth, vermin, contamination. In truth, there have always been people in her country who hated her ethnic group, but now their views will be fully validated and normalized. In six months, this well-appointed sitting room will be ransacked and most of the remaining possessions that aren't shattered or stolen by an emboldened police force will be sold off so that the family can survive for two years. The girl's parents will spend those two years in a struggle against a mighty bureaucracy as they attempt to get out of a once beloved city whose majority population now sees them as enemies of a new empire. Having lost all rights, the family will now be stateless. Across the ocean, the latest incarnation of the xenophobic isolationist America First movement is in full sway. Immigrants are suspect, even those who have thrown off most of their traditional customs in an effort to assimilate, to become Americans. The girl looks at me intently and I meet her gaze. 80 years have passed since a camera captured her face in the midst of a gentle winter afternoon. Now the gyres of history have revolved, promoted by another would-be authoritarian and obsessive hand washer. America First is back, bla emblazoned on posters, t-shirts, and red baseball caps. I flip the photograph. On the reverse side, a diligent family archivist has written January 1938 in soft pencil. The nine-year-old girl in the frilly dress lived in Vienna, Austria, where a world of safety and comfort was about to end. Her name was Ava and she was my mother. I knew her as Eve. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before, but this really got me this time. <laughs> Sometimes it gets me too. Uh, yeah, well, so uh, thank you all. I'm so pleased to be here on this on this day. And um, I think we should, we'll launch right into our questions that we've uh, compiled really to find, uh, I think what we're all searching for right now, here we are in Zoom land, but we're, we're all together. And uh, I really love that we're able to do this all together. So um, I think we'll start with your book, Laura, and uh, I'll ask you my first question. Okay. Yeah. So um, the, your book introduces us to four very different kind of women. And I think uh, one of the things that people always want to know when, you know, ask novelists is how you created these characters, whether they were people that you know, whether it's some part of yourself, and just where, how they how they emerged for you as a novelist. Okay, Yo, there's a little feedback. Um, Julie, you want to mute, if you mute your mic while I talk, I think it's going to fix that. Okay, let's see, mute. I will do that, okay? I think, I think that's, I, there it is, it worked. So, um, so thanks for asking that question. So the novel is my true love. And um, on the other side of this wall, there are a whole bunch of unpublished ones. Some of them are even good, um, but I'm known for memoir. And I actually, because of the, the structure of the set, I, I actually, I've got my memoir right there, but it's my, it's my, it's my novel that I'm promoting. And I, I, I love, I love that um, when you write a novel, you can you can create a world, you can rewrite history, you can um, you can let the characters sprout wings and flow out 
the window if they want to. Um, but I wanted to write a novel that captures the magic of what happens on my Haven writing retreats. And Alex talked about those a bit. And um, I think you can also feel the teaching spirit that I have that um, runs through the letter to the reader of the book. So I wanted to capture what happens when people step outside of their comfort zone and join small circles of supportive seekers in order to find their voices and tell their stories and dig deeply into their self-awareness. And especially out here in Montana, where I've lived for 30 years, I'm originally from the Midwest. Hello, Missouri. Um, um, but I've been out here in Montana for 30 years and have raised two kids here. And I've worked with over a thousand people at my various Haven writing programs for the last nine years. Of course, we weren't able to do it this last year, but we're coming back this fall and the retreats are booking. And I'm so excited about it because I think that when we leave home, something happens. And it helps us to bridge to new community in order to bridge back more authentically and powerfully to our daily communities. And I think that when people gather in intentional small groups like this far from home, they connect to themselves in a way that, that perhaps they can't in the rigor and the wear of their daily lives. And so that's what I hear over and over again. And I, I remember sitting on my bed, um, when all those good ideas happen in that meditative waking trance early in the morning and thinking, how can I capture what happens on these retreats in a novel and not have it be about a writing retreat? So in no way is this book about a writing retreat, although there is some writing in it. Um, but once I imagined the shape of the book, then I, I had to figure out how to people the book. And of course, I'm not exposing anybody on the retreat so um, or who's come. So I wanted to create four very different characters all at major and relatable crossroads moments in their lives. So I say that none of these characters is me, none is anyone I know, and yet they are all of us. So in getting to know these characters, I knew I needed to go straight into their central conflicts. And I wanted to choose central conflicts that were relatable. And so I chose four of them. And Willa, who's our protagonist, hers is um, the Emersonian dream of self-reliance versus interdependence, which is community and relying on one another, which um, we all need to be doing right now. So self-reliance versus interdependence. Um, then Jane's central uh, conflict was that money doesn't bring you happiness or social prestige doesn't bring you happiness. It gives you comfort and choices. And she's very very conflicted about that. She's based all her, her life on the myth that money brings you happiness is true and, and realizes that, that it's not true. And then Bliss's central conflict is faith versus religion, faith versus religion. And I think that comes up for a lot of people, especially in middle age. And then Harriet's central conflict is addiction to ambition. And that's something I know a lot about, addiction to ambition. So in fiction, you really have to let the characters tell their story. And then the characters, the kinds of books that I write are more character driven. So the, the, the characters beget the plot, the plot begets the story and the resolve. So it means that we need to know as novelists um, what our central, what the character's central conflicts are and be willing to go deeply into them to push for resolve, but not be invested in resolve actually happening. And when you let the characters, and probably Alex George knows this too, because he's a novelist, when you hand it over to the characters, they might go in places that you didn't necessarily want them to go. So that was the inception of the book um, and these characters and how they came to me. But again, I'm not exposing anybody in any of my retreats or anybody I know, but these are things that were near and dear to my heart. So you ready for your question, Julie? <laughs> and maybe I'll do the same thing. I'll mute myself uh, when you go. So here's my question for you. My first question for you. So both of our books have a strong storytelling theme. Some stories are true and some are myth, especially in families when they are passed on from generation to generation. Can you speak about the role of memory and storytelling in your memoir? Yes, yeah, so the what I always say about my about my family is that, and I think it's quite common in what we call uh, second generation, Holocaust families, so I'm, I'm second generation then, uh, is that often our parents didn't, didn't really wanna share these stories. They weren't very comfortable doing it. Um, sometimes in, in my mother's case, there were, there were the myths. And well, I call them myths in the sense that these were the stories she was comfortable telling. I think she, uh, she tended to tell them the same way 
wherever I would, she would tell them to me a certain way. I would hear her telling her friends at a dinner party the same way. And eventually when she gave an interview to um, a research institute, the Leo Beck Institute uh, that um, I love so much and they helped me so much. So big shout out to them. Um, she told the stories the same way for them. Uh, so a lot of my mission in writing this book was really to figure out um, whether they were true, whether the stories were true that I had grown up with. Some of them seemed so unbelievable that I thought they can't possibly be true. But in fact, what I found after a lot of digging and investigation um, is that the craziest stories were true. The ones that had seemed so unbelievable uh, really were, in fact, the, you know, after doing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, digging, that they were true. And this was gratifying to me because I think when we inherit, you know, we inherit many things from our family, and one of them is stories. So I felt like I couldn't um, really construct the memoir without understanding if those stories, you know, if they had a good foundation. So um, I hope, so that's uh, the answer to that question. But it's, um, I think it's something that memoir writers really grapple with a lot because it's, um, uh, you know, when when we're dealing with people's memories, you you never know whether to trust your own, whether to trust the memories of, uh, your ancestors and the and your parents and the stories that get passed down. So that's always the uh, the, di the dilemma. It's so true. It's so true. I just want to piggyback on this because I help a lot of people write memoirs. Yeah. And, I'm in too. and, and to write past the fear of exposure is, is terrifying for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and that's why we really have to believe in storytelling and both of us do. And so this is for anybody out there in the audience. You know what, maybe just mute yourself for one second. There we go. So for anybody out there in the audience, if you're thinking about having the courage to, to tell a story, whether it's in fiction or nonfiction, or just to your family or, or friends, to, to find the courage is to truly value the art and power of storytelling from one generation to the next. And like Julie said, sometimes they're true, sometimes they're myth, but we've got to keep storytelling alive. Got to keep them alive. Okay, so... Shall we keep going on this question braid, my friend? Great. Okay. And yeah, so the next uh, thing you, you sort of addressed it a little bit in the letter that you read and in that opening section, but I think a lot of um, what your characters are dealing with is that they're all in this moment of transition. And so I think, you know, we've all confronted these moments, you know, the beginning and ending of careers, the ends, beginnings and ends of relationships, marriage, um, raising children. And I uh, just wondered if you could speak a little bit about that, about the that experience of writing those transitions and just how it kind of affected you emotionally and spiritually while you're writing as you engaged with those characters. Great question. I'm going to move. There you go. So, so I, I kind of addressed some of that in the last question answer, and then also, like Julie said in the letter to the reader. But I wanted to expose if I, if I'm if we we're just talking about um, the power of storytelling, and um, I was just riffing off of what Julie was saying, the importance of storytelling, and writing past the fear of exposure, or speaking past the fear of exposure, if you're um, using verbal self-expression. One of the things that came up for me in terms of the process of writing Willis Grove was a, a kind of an old personal trigger or even a childhood wound. And anybody who's writing, that, that stuff comes up for them and we have to have the courage to write past it. And so that's the value of writing stories and, and passing them on. So in each of these, for each of these characters in Willow's Grove, they come together and, and to figure out what's next in their life, which means they have to tell each other their stories. And two of them want to, and two of them don't. And, and so they break it down into what was supposed to happen and then what actually happened. So like the first hundred pages of this book 
are four women talking in a farmhouse and having tea and making dinner together and sitting around a table and they don't all know each other. So it's awkward. Two of them or one of them at least is staring at the exit sign the whole time, realizing she's in rural Montana and there's no Uber. <laughs> and there's not an, uh, an airport anywhere nearby. And so um, one, what, what got triggered for me when I was writing it, and because you asked about process, was something I heard a lot as a child, and that is, you talk too much. Even just saying that gives me this sort of feeling of shame. And so what, I, what, what I've learned about writing is that the reader really appreciates when you go into that sticky place and, and go through it, and I call it going public even if it's fiction. So I allowed the characters, because that's what they I knew needed to happen um, and that would be good for them in the end to tell their stories. And so as I was writing the book, there were times when I worried that they were talking too much and that I would get, you know, once you get a book published and you've had a lot of people, you know, critique it, you start to, um, it, it's just different than the purity of writing it alone. But I realized that these women need to talk just like we all need to talk. And they said yes to the invitation, which means that true to it, they need to tell their stories. So I think also if there are writers out there and you feel resistance in the writing, it's the same thing with life. The resistance is usually something that's telling you um, that you need to go more deeply into it, just like conflict. And so I allowed myself to um, go to the places that were uncomfortable with that personal trigger of you talk too much and I let them talk. And do you know, I've gotten very little criticism about it. And part of the trick of it, you know, when you're writing fiction is narrative flow and movement. How do you do that? Well, so you'll, if you read Willis Grove, you'll see that they, they begin um, with talking around a table and then they go into another room and they do more talking and then they go up to the front porch and they do more talking and they go into another room and do more talking. But you know, what, what I've heard most of all from people is that they really loved that dialogue and that's what hooked them. And that surprises me. And in a way, and I haven't said this before or really even thought it, but it was really healing for me personally. That, that people actually, they're like, oh no, I love that. That's that's part of why I read the book and loved it so much is that these women were, whether they liked it or not, they were creating the space to have those conversations. So that is my answer to that question, Julie Matt. Yeah, I think that's that's so interesting because I think, you know, um, when when we talk about the writing experience, I really do think it's when you find yourself in, in the really scary place where you're not sure if what you're doing is gonna work. Um, uh, this could be rationalizing, but I really do think that's when you start getting into the meat of, meat of the project is, is when it starts getting terrifying. <laughs> and when you're, when you're pretty sure that, well, when you're not sure how you're gonna resolve, how you're gonna be able to resolve it. So I think that's, um, it's interesting that that was your trigger because I know that I had um, different kind of triggers when I was working, which is, um, is my family going to be really angry with me? And are they, you know, um, am I revealing too much? There was actually one section where, because um, a lot of the book actually was based on, uh, I interviewed my dad who has a wonderful memory and remembers everything. And um, uh, there, there was one section where I, I just sent him the pages and asked him if if it was okay, you know, can I can I go with this? But if I feel I think that's so true, what you're describing is that the thing that is frightening is actually the thing that's really going to um, potentially engage your readers is uh, that it's unfamiliar and and new and fresh. So. And I think that we both know from writing memoirs, one of the number one things that you hear from people. From, from readers is thank you for helping me know I'm not alone. Yeah. And that's because you wrote past the fear of exposure. So actually this is a perfect segue into my next question, Julie. And that is, yeah. so, and I love knowing that you you reach out to your father. Um, the book's about mother and mothers and daughters. Mm -hmm. And that's always a complicated, not always, but in this case, complicated story. So what inspired you to delve into this relationship so intensively and what advice would you have for people who feel that they need to illuminate the stories of their forebears yet resist it? So it's a little bit what we were just talking about, 
Yeah. I'd love to hear that. And I'll mute myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happened was that my mother and I, you know, like many mothers and daughters, we had a very complicated relationship. It wasn't, it wasn't always easy. Maybe who knows? We were perhaps both very stubborn people. And so there was often some, some conflict. Um, I always had a feeling of never quite connecting in the way that I might have wanted to. Um, after she died, um, when my, uh, it was just a short time after she died, uh, we were organizing her belongings and I went into, um, it was uh, clearly her secret drawer. It was where she kept her nightgowns and, and uh, things that were very, you know, just like her, her uh, nightgowns and slips and things like that. She knew no one else was going into that drawer. And in the way, way back of the drawer, I felt something hard <laughs> that didn't belong. I pulled it out and it was a, a small book, um, a little, uh, I guess we would call it an autograph book. Um, they were a certain, st certain type of book. At the time, I didn't know what it was, but later I found out that these um, little keepsake books were wildly popular in Germany and Austria during that period. And I pulled the book out and you open it up and it was um, um, signatures from her friends and family, a teacher, uh, older relatives, things like that. Um, I showed it to my dad who was standing near, nearby and I asked him if he'd ever seen it. Um, he said, no, he had never seen it. My parents were married for 54 years. They were very close. Um, he had never seen this book. And then I realized that this had been, this book was sort of holding, holding a lot of pain and sadness. Uh, there were children who signed that book, who drew little pictures in that book. And um, you wonder, you wonder what happened to them if they got out. Um, I was able to find out one of her teachers signed the book and, and did not survive. So that book really, she never was able to share it. And um, I felt like though at the same time, I thought she couldn't share it in her lifetime, but she had left me all of this material. She had left me uh, all these photographs and this book. And um, it was almost like she was uh, leaving me clues to follow. Um, at times, I will say that the writing process um, did start to feel a little bit like a seance <laughs> that I often felt we were communicating in a way that we weren't always able to communicate in, in life. So um, uh, yeah, I think it's really uh, was, was quite a spiritual process for me. Um, I will ask you the next question and it's a little bit back to talking about what happens at your retreats. I think all of us um, would love to be able to go to Montana and, and be in one of these um, communities together. And I just um, wanted to know if you could talk about certain encounters that you've had with, you know, with not revealing, of course, people, but just the sort of what happens at these retreats that um, that really kind of um, epitomizes this idea of of communi you know of what happens when people come together and are willing to share. And we need it more than ever right now. I mean, it's just. I mean, I don't know more than ever, right? Because I haven't lived since the beginning of time. But I, I, I can say that after this last year and a half, and who knows what what's going to happen going forward. But um, I know people are starting to open up again and starting to, you know, retreat leaders are leading retreats again. And we're all hopefully being very cautious about it. Mine don't start till the fall. Hopefully people um, will be vaccinated and it'll be safe. But we, we still don't know. But I do know the people are hungry for it. And even before the pandemic, um, I would hear over and over again, just like, you know, like we're your best group, right? There's just no way that, that, that these people could be this great in a small group of seven or eight people, you know, that I would never meet in my normal life that come from all over the place because I do have a foundation. So I'm able to support people um, financially through the foundation. So it's, it is, it is, um, it's diverse in terms of the people who come 
it's not just for wealthy um, people in any way at all, because the foundation um, is for seekers and people who, who I call word wanderers. And I, I tell them every single time, it's always like this. It's always like this. It's, and I think it has something to do with what happens when you intentionally leave home and come someplace. You know, would it would it work in a hotel? I've done it. I've done it in a hotel in Boston. I've done it in. Um, I did it in Morocco, uh, which was fantastic. But I, I really, there's something that happens out here. And there's a line at the end of the book, and I, I won't give away the ending, but. Um, in no way is this a book about four women in a house. The, Montana is actually a character in it. And at the, toward the end of the book, they're doing this um, really cool exercise that's on this bridge with water flowing through spring runoff. It's, a, it's about the time, it's a, about a month from where we are right now in Montana. And, um, and actually, if you win my, my, my book, you get a, a bookmark that has the prompt that they do on it that I'll sign. And at the end of doing this exercise, Jane, who's from New York and very well healed and very much in that sort of get the kids to the Ivy League schools and the right prep schools and the whole thing. She says, I love who I've been in Montana. No, she says, I love who I've been in nature. I just don't, and this isn't an exact quote, but I just don't know if I'm gonna be able to bring that back home with me. And Willa says to her, but Jane, you are nature. And that's what I've learned living here for 30 years, even though I still consider myself a city girl, that we are nature. And that means that, that you can learn it in the wilderness, but it also applies to a midtown Manhattan elevator. We are nature wherever we go. And especially this time of year with the birds coming back, um, I'm reminded of that every time that, that we need to learn from what we call nature, which is wilderness and find the wilderness within. And there's a lot, there are a lot of books, uh, birds in the book. And it's for that reason, because the birds have been my best teacher. So, so that, that's what I wanted to capture in terms of community. And now we need, we need community. And, you know, I heard Julie say earlier that she goes up to the Adirondacks or, you know, a lot of people um, have found refuge this last year in a lake house or on the shore or away from cities. And I think we need to bring community back wherever we are and really find the community of people who can tell stories and with you and and feel safe. And I think that's so important. So so Julie, I've got one more question for you. Okay, I'm unmute. I'm unmuting. You're unmuting. Okay. So well I've got a few more questions. But yeah. so your your memoir, and I love how these piggyback upon each other, you yeah. know. Because what I always say is that fiction is realer than real. It's the same as memoir. There's somebody in the chat that's asking how to write a memoir. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's a come to haven. Age old question. <laughs> you, you know, but it's um, it's really about uh, honoring the story. And the story is the same with, in, in whatever genre, right? So, so I think that fiction is distilled reality. Like it's realer than real. So to that end, Julie Metz, your memoir incorporates incorporate some fictional devices, mm -hmm. which I loved as somebody who loves fiction so much. So Why did you choose to do this? And what was that experience like for you as a memoirist? Yeah, so it was an interesting thing because um, uh, I had spent many years researching and reporting and I really wanted, you know, I, I, I do believe that a memoir should be you know, the truth, I mean, to the degree that you can, you know, and of course that's always complicated. But the situation that happened with this book was that a lot of the people were were lost to me. They were, they were long gone. And there were a lot of holes in the story. And it, at, at one point, actually, I thought, I'm, I'm never gonna figure this out. I should write a novel. And then I stopped doing that. And then I returned to the idea of doing a memoir. And then when I kind of hit a wall, I was actually I was ac actually at a residency when I realized that I had to figure out some way of of helping the reader um, place themselves in this historical time and imagine situations that that even that I had to imagine myself. So I thought I will I will try. Uh, including some fictional passages. And I felt I can do this um, authentically as long as I know that I've done 
my research and I know that the, the scenes that I'm creating are plausible and that, um, that uh, they're based on the, the best research that I could do. So once I started doing that, I found um, that actually I really enjoyed it and um, I enjoyed the experience. It felt like time traveling for me and you know maybe you you're already familiar with this experience as a novelist but for me it was quite new and uh, it also helped me get to the place of uh, really including myself in the story when I realized that that the that I was going to sort of braid the narrative between these events in the past that I was writing about and then including myself in the story as as uh, as the narrator so that's, um, uh, uh, well, the next project I'm working on, it looks like it will be fiction. We never know, but <laughs> that's sort of where it's going. And I would say it was, it was um, very much inspired by um, taking this leap into, into fiction writing for the purposes of, of, uh, of, of filling in times and, and places that I couldn't do in any other way. So, um, so yeah. I'm actually in the interest of time, we've got some questions. Mm. Yes, let's do. Let's take I'm some questions. I'll actually ask you my last question and because I think you can keep talking and I think it's gonna it's gonna okay. answer. So I'm gonna let's just keep doing this. So the, my last question for you is structure is one of the hardest things about writing a book in any genre. Because one of the questions here in the chat is the, somebody's uh, 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 Dixie. Hi, Dixie is asking about how to how to write books and um, and she wants advice about great writing books and I think my answer to that is read 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 never give your books away write all over them <laughs> they're, they're primers you know and yeah, so and that's, that's the way to learn and I'm actually writing one right now that I wish I could just give to you Dixie but so so structure is the number one most difficult thing for all writers across the yeah. board and so Julie so talk to us uh, uh, your memoir is a braid of braided narrative that weaves you as a researcher and your family's history as you discovered it. How did the structure evolve as a way of telling the story, which is very similar from what you were just talking about? So yeah, I mean, it's related because one kind of, um, it's true, you know, characters are everything. And when you're writing a memoir, it's the same, uh, same situation as when you're writing a novel. You have characters, you have to start with your characters and in, in the case of a memoir, of course, there are events that happen, but you really do have to struggle and find the motivation, just as you would when you're writing fictional characters. In my case, the, the storyline um, happened over, uh, over many years. It took me a long time to research the book, and that's where really the braided narrative evolved, because I realized I would need to place myself in the story and mark time for the reader uh, in that way, so that there's me, you know, just my mother pass, you know, my mother dies. I find this book, and then there's that narrative moving forward, and then I return to the past of this uh, very um, kind of the last glorious time of the Jewish community in Vienna uh, in the 20s and 30s. It was an incredibly vibrant community, and I travel back to re-inhabit that time period. So I will say that there were some very dark days <laughs> where um, uh, I was, I spent a lot of them at residencies because, and I will say residencies are a beautiful thing because you're alone, you don't have to do your laundry or cook. <laughs> um, and and you, there you are with the, with the page in front of you and, and you, I'm always amazed at how much work I get done in a very short amount of time. But there was one residency where I really did find, it's sort of, as you pointed out, sometimes it's as you're waking up in the morning and you're kind of groggy with sleep, it's sort of that, I don't know, liminal space between waking and dreaming is when the good ideas come. And I, it really did come just like that. And so I will say to the writers out there, it's, you just have to have faith that it will come if you don't give up and you keep moving, you know, keep working on it. Um, I noticed in the chat, um, I think uh, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott is a wonderful book. And the title of that book, which is 
her central advice, which is really do a little bit at a time and just keep going forward is really some of the best advice that you can, you can have. I think people sometimes get overwhelmed uh, trying to imagine that they're going to come up with the beautiful idea all at once. There might be writers who write perfect paragraphs and perfect pages, but I don't know about you, Laura, but I don't know any of them. <laughs> um, so it's all rewriting. It's all uh, kind of trying things out and seeing if they work. And uh, You have to love the process. I, I, I'm gonna, well, will you mute yourself for one second, Julie? Oh, yes. Same person. Just yes, wonderful about, book. Yeah, about, wonderful book. I never, I haven't read Stephen King's stuff. And Neither I, have I. I'm too scared. I don't like people. I'm like, too scared. <laughs> but this, this book is really cool. And yeah. what he does at the end is he actually captures, look, he, he um, and this is a dying thing because, yeah. we, I mean, I used to print out everything and edit like this. And now we do everything on our computer. So th yeah. that, that is... Um, yeah, it's a great book. It's so funny because I have a very low fright tolerance, so I can't go to scary movies and I can't read Stephen King novels. I'd be up all night. But that book is really beautiful. The other one I can recommend is um, this one, which I keep by my desk. It's quite ratty because I left it out in the rain, which is uh, Danny Shapiro's uh, uh, Still Writing. It's a wonderful book and um, has helped me a lot. So I, I keep that... Um, I keep that right near my desk when things get dark. <laughs> so. and, and Danny's the reason why I started leading writing retreats because we yeah. did an event together. We did a book festival actually at the Miami Book Fair and we were put together and we became friends. That was 10 years ago. And she was the one that said, I really think that you you've got a you're you've got an extroverted personality. You can hold a group together well. And so and she's thanked actually in Willis Grove for for um, inspiring me to do retreats. Yeah. So looking at some of these yeah. questions, um, so, so really, you know, what gives you both the inspiration to focus on writing? I mean, that's a huge question. I'd like to take it. Can I take Go for it? Go for it. I'll mute while you, uh, while okay. you're out there. Okay. Yeah. So you, and Julie was just touching on it. I mean, you, anybody who writes 10 easy steps for writing, I'm sorry, run for the hills run for the hills. There are not 10 easy steps. Yes, you can read Strunk and White every year, which I always do, and White as an E.B. White, um, who wrote Charlotte's Web, and with his professor, Strunk. Um, I read it every year, the elements of style and both Strunk and White, Stephen King and I can tell you all about why you should never use an adverb. Um, they take away, they suck the life force from the verb. Choose a better verb, but really other than <laughs> And I could probably bullet point some things, but it's all about loving the process. So how do you give yourself permission to love the process and how do you show up for it? So one thing that some writing teachers are out there saying is that you have to write every day or authors are saying, I disagree with that. Find a writing process that you can fall in love with. And I always say I've created flexible children and I've created a flexible writer in myself. I started writing my first book in 1988 when I finished college. And like I said earlier, I've got about 24 books. Some of them are even good on the other side of that wall. They're exercises in learning. It's it's not about that you write to get published. It, it's that you write because, because you need to build that bridge to yourself. And if you can't build that bridge to yourself, how are you ever going to build the bridge to the reader? So you can turn a, a phrase or twist a plot or have a fabulous command of the English language till the cows come home, as we say in Montana. But if you don't have your finger on the pulse of what it is that you have to say and why you have to say it, then especially if you can turn a phrase or twist a plot or have a fabulous command of the English language, the reader will read it and feel frustrated and not know why and throw it across the room or close it or give it to a friend or put it in the free library. So it all begins with self-awareness and a hunger for your own voice. So what does that mean? And the way that I teach it is um, that we have to get aware of ourselves and do it in a way that's working for our lives. So um, you've got to create a writing practice that's based on your personality. When you have time, um, when you hunger for it based on what your responsibilities are, when you, when the creative flow happens for you, for me, it's either really early in the, in the morning in that meditative waking trance that Julie was just talking about, or it's about three o'clock in the afternoon. And then after about five o'clock PM, forget it. 
no, not for me. And and yet I change it as I go. And I think I heard a writer, somebody I love very much uh, as a writer on the page, a novelist and memoirist, um, David James Duncan, Montanan also, originally from Oregon. And he said, you have to be hungry for your voice. And that was the best advice I, I've ever had so that you're reading somebody else's book and you think, I want to read my book. Julie, how about you? What gets you going? How do you how do you keep your practice going? Well, I, I think um, you've touched on you've touched on that thing that really I think everybody we're all individuals and you really do have to find a rhythm that works for you. Um, you know, I I've also I'm also a mother, so when when I was working when my child was young, um, my daughter was um, cutting up scraps of paper on the floor in my office so that I could so that I could do my work. And I think that's, um, uh, it's really is a very personal thing. Some people write in the morning, some people write at night. Um, I'm kind of a night owl as it happens, you know? Yeah, but it's, I, I think it really is such an individual thing. I think for me, the, we were talking about it at the very beginning, uh, you know, Laura, you were talking a bit about this, that when things get scary, I think, a lot of people want to push it away and they don't, they're afraid to continue. But, but I really do feel that when the material starts to get a little scary and you're not sure if what you're doing is going to work out, that's when you're really getting into it, into the, into the meat. And I think it's, um, it's very important to stick with it through those kind of scary times. It, it will resolve. I, I believe that, and I've um, in my own writing. I in each book uh, I've only written two, but in in both books there was there was always a, a very dark, you know, the so-called dark night of the soul <laughs> um, in screenwriting. And you you have one where you really just do not know what you are up to at all and whether it's going to work out. But I really feel if you just see it through and stick with it, that you'll find it you'll find it, but you, you really need to stay with it. That's right. And Penny is asking, it's basically what you just said, both mm -hmm. of you have been very successful in your careers. Does it get easier or less scary after you've <laughs> experienced success? And I would say, well, first of no. all, <laughs> the word success is very subjective, right? Yeah. I remember, um, and I won't name names or where I was, but I remember I was sitting at a table with a bunch of authors and, uh, you know, I was kind of new girl on the block, but I, I probably have written just as many books as anybody at that table and, um, or maybe even more. And, I, you know, I've sat at that intersection of heart and craft and mind that is the writing life since 1988 and even maybe before that without knowing it. And, um, and I remember just thinking, like, I know myself on the page and I know the woman that I am. And I'm so glad that a lot of those books weren't published back in my 20s when I was, you know, writing uh, coming of age stories. Um, I have something to write about now. But she says, does it get easier or less scary after you've experienced success? And I, I, I think that first you have to break down your idea of what success is. But most, like everybody sitting at that table that day, you know, one person had won a national book award, but not a Pulitzer. One person had never won anything and and yet was a New York Times bestselling author. And my I wasn't yet a New York Times bestselling author. And I remember thinking, thank God I know the process and love the process because the process, it's like you're out on scaffolding, holding on for dear life. Yeah. Remember, nobody asks us to write these things. Yeah. So we're we're we have to become our own champion. That's why we need each other. Why I lead retreats. Why Julie and I are friends. Writers need each other. And so I think that that it, you know you also have to look at what's scary. The whole thing is scary, and yet you have to almost look at it like um like it's. I'll just say one more thing about this. Um, a very good friend of mine who was in a writing group with me when I lived in Seattle a long time ago got her MFA at, at Sarah Lawrence in New York, and she called me the night before graduation. And she said, let me get this straight. You actually like this. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, yeah. I mean, and I say now it's my practice, my prayer, my way of my, my meditation, my way of life, and sometimes my way to life. And she said, I just spent a whole lot of time and money to realize that I don't like this. So if you oh, don't like it, don't do it. Yeah, don't do it. That doesn't mean it's easy. And so when yeah. I find your voice and come to Haven or I'll help you find your voice, it's not that 
It's not that it's easy, but it's where you find flow. It's where you lose track of time. It's where you find ease. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I don't think it ever gets easier because I really do think, you know, as Laura's saying, um, and as we touched on a little bit, the process is about going very deep into into a place. And even if you're if you're writing about yourself, you'll have moments where you really have to you really have to get in there and be to a very honest place. Um, but when you're writing fiction, I mean, it's already started with the with the project I'm working on now. You know, you you carry those characters around with you during the day. You know, you think about them. They they've become part of you. They're people you know. You're worried about them. You know, and so it it's never it's never going to be an easy process, but it is a very fulfilling process. So I think that's the difference. I mean, um, that easy. I don't know if I'm interested in easy <laughs> personally in my life, <laughs> um, okay. but. It's it's uh, I want to feel connected to what I'm doing and and fulfilled and so to get to that place you you know you you have to uh, put an effort and that's always going to be um, that's always going to be a challenge it, it I don't feel like I I bet if I wrote 20 books I bet it'll feel the same at the beginning of every one I bet it'll always be scary and I'll always be convinced that I'm never going to write another word. <laughs> That you know that, and then you start, and you're like, okay, I remember this feeling. I'll get through it. You know, it'll it'll happen. Yeah, beautiful. Well, I think Alex, I think we're ready for you. There he is. There he is. Thank you, Alex, for it, including us in your beautiful um, festival. This has been a real great treat for both of us. Well, it was a treat to listen to you both, and, and thank you for such wonderful inspiring talk i particularly loved uh, the permission give yourself permission to love the process i mean it's so so important i've had many people come up to me uh, with an, a number of different ideas and then they've said so which one do you think is most likely to get me published oh. and i just want to sort of run away yeah. <laughs> you're asking the wrong question that is absolutely yeah. you know, so which one is the and the answer i always give is which one is, is the one that sort of moves you the most because the one that you the moves you the most is the one that you're going to do the best with and that's the one that therefore is going to be the most likely mm -hmm. but it's just so much the wrong question you've got yeah. to enjoy the process um so thank you for that that was absolutely wonderful and i'm just going to throw in a couple of other you mentioned um danny's book uh, which is wonderful and there are a couple of other ones and um, i do either of you know the war of art by stephen pressfield no what's it called no. the war of art oh it sounds uh, great yeah, it's really good. Um, and I, I was given it probably 15 years ago now. And uh, it's really just a very no-nonsense, um, rather bracing <laughs> book about sort of yeah. don't, don't, don't it, this, it, and it's, it's against flame outs. And it's sort of saying mm -hmm. you need to do it every day or not every day. I like what you said actually very much about not doing it every day, but, but you just need to be regular and you need to treat it like a job. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was interesting and then the other two and this is one that i i don't know why more people don't know about this book i don't know if you can see it it's a bit in the glare but um so oh, Conrad yeah. Khan, who is a fabulous yeah. wonderful fabulous novelist yeah. writer uh, and letters to a young writer is just a wonderful it's a short book full of wisdom and 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 uh, I, I loved it and then finally sorry this sounds like i'm no. and then this yeah, just came out, out. I, um, I have it. I have a copy. It, yeah. it is. It's so wonderful. And this is George Saunders, uh, who was our keynote a couple of years ago at Unbound, um, just analyzing seven amazing uh, Russian short stories. But for me, the gold in the book uh, are the, the interludes when he talks about his own process. And uh, Julie, you were talking earlier about how no one ever writes a perfect paragraph. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. um, um, but but what he talks about, and he calls it a practice. It's a practice of revision and, and editing. Yeah. Um, and he goes back hundreds and hundreds of times. Yeah. Um, and that is absolutely uh, it's more than an integral part of the process. It, it is the process. Yeah, it is the process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like sometimes people say, oh, well, how many drafts did you write? Yeah. I'm like, I, I don't know, a thousand, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it just, you, it, because it's always about rewriting. That really is the work. 
I yeah. think it, it might be a bit like actors learning a role. You know, you learn your lines, but it's not just about learning the lines. You have to, they have to become part of you and then you can become that character. So I think if you, if you, if you know that that process of just revisiting, revisiting, there's parts I'm sure Laura will say the same. You know, there's parts of of my two books that uh, where at a sentence level, you know, there's some sentence that's just not working that's driving you crazy. You have to keep keep working on it till it till it pleases you. So. Yeah. And, and I think you it, it takes a long time to learn how to be a writer and an editor at the same time. And I mm -hmm. recommend go into that flow place as the writer and the creator, and then you go in in a secondary way as an editor. And so, um, you know, like this is the 19th draft of this. I wrote the first thing, you know, and then the first draft of it nine years ago or eight years ago. And I thought, okay, all right, now I, I'm beginning to understand what this book is. So now I'll start again. And you have to be, you know, joyful. I don't know if joyful is the right word, but hungry is a good one. But, you know, I, hard writing, I mean, easy reading is hard writing. So yeah. if someone says, right. oh, I right. it's in a weekend, that didn't just happen by magic. People. Yeah. That happened because of many years of grit and yeah. a little grace along the way. Yeah. Beautifully, Definitely. beautifully put. So, but before I forget, um, Suzanne, uh, if you're still watching, you were the randomly selected uh, audience member who has won the book. So if you would please shoot us uh, an email to mail at unboundbookfestival.com uh, with your address and we will get those two wonderful books to you. All right. Well, we are just about done. Thank you both so much. This was, this was so, so, so enjoyable. Thank um, and our thanks too to this evening's sponsor, uh, Friends of MU Libraries. Uh, we are back next week to uh, our usual Tuesday, Thursday slots. On Tuesday, we have a very interesting discussion uh, called You Do the Math, which is about writing about math. Uh, which is a bit of a departure for us. And we're very much looking forward to that. And then on Thursday, we have uh, our final, unbelievably, our final poetry reading of the festival. Um, so uh, I hope that you'll be able to join us for those. Um, thank you all for watching. Laura, Julie, thank you for a wonderful, you. fantastic conversation. Yeah, it's been you. great. Mm -hmm. and, uh, have a great evening, everybody. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.